We'll uh, <laughs> take into uh, uh, beginning our Rockwood Water PUD Board of Directors meeting, May 23rd, <coughs> 6 o'clock. And we'll begin with the approval of the agenda. <coughs> Is there any changes? Uh, no changes, right. Mr. President. Okay. And I'll ask for a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. And a second, please. A second. And all in favor say aye. 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 And number two is <coughs> approval of the consent agenda. Any changes or corrections? Uh, no changes to the, uh, the minutes. Okay, thank you, Brian. Or the consent. Mm -hmm. And uh, a motion to approve the consent agenda, please. I'll approve. Okay, motion and a second, please. I'll second. Okay, thank you. And all in favor say aye. 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 Very good. And then we go to number three, approval of the minutes, April 18th, regular board <coughs> session action. Is um, Brian have any corrections and then the board as well? Yeah, uh, no corrections. Uh, President okay. Lewis. And Larry, Kobe, Kathy? No, no corrections or difference. Okay. 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 Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Very good. And a second, please. All second. Thank you, Larry. And <clears throat> all in favor say aye. 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 And then we're into approval of the bills. And just yeah, uh, right. Pres President Lewis, uh, members of the board, there is one item I wanted to draw your attention to. And if you look at the bottom of your, uh, your packet, page 36, so at the bottom, and then uh, if you roll it uh, just about five lines from the bottom, You'll see uh, Insurance General, and you can see how much we budgeted around 67, and you can see the expenditure is uh, 125. Uh, right now, we think that's a uh, what happened is we we encumber the money, and then as you know, we pay the bills, we draw the encumbrance down, not uh, double double bills. So we think that's why that uh, number is so so high. So just wanted to bring that to your attention because it definitely jumped out to uh, uh, Daniel and myself that, you know, that, that number was way off, off the mark. So other than that, uh, any questions? Okay. And that doesn't, uh, I'm trying to do the math in my head real quick, but uh, couldn't be a turnover from physical year to kind of like we've got two mm -hmm. bills in double, month. Double, double. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, President uh, Lewis, uh, board, uh, don't think so. I thought we were pretty well covered for last year, and I, I wouldn't anticipate they would bill us that far in advance for next fiscal year. But, you know, it's not definitely something uh, we'll keep an eye on. Uh, if that is indeed what happened, we will ask them to try to keep their billings in the same fiscal year because we budget like that we don't budget double payments one year and nothing the next so right. but okay. we'll definitely look into it okay thank you and any other questions on the checks and no questions okay Kathy, I'll give you a second okay i had um, a question on page 25 the uh food grade grease for 310.45. What is what is that? Um, we use it for um, hydrants. We use it for tapping. It's it's a it's a, anything that comes in contact with the water system that um, it'll it'll need to be a food grade uh, grease. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. And Larry, any questions? I have none. Okay. And I don't have any items. So ask for a motion to approve the bills. Okay. I'll 
Thank you. And all in favor say aye. 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 And brings us to number five, public comment on non-agenda items. I don't see any buddy dancing out of their seat there. So. <laughs> We'll go to number six, and that's 2018 Summer Supply Plan Discussion. And General Manager Stahl. Yes, uh, President Lewis, uh, members of the board, you have uh, our 2018 uh, outlook as far as summer supply. Uh, currently, it looks like uh, the water in Bull Run, uh, the dams are full. Uh, they don't anticipate really starting drawdown on uh, either one of the two reservoirs up there for at least uh, several months. We have our groundwater supply that uh, has been on and uh, is uh, prepared uh, to fire. And so uh, from a, a production outlook, uh, we're looking pretty good for the summer. Uh, it uh, looks like it's going to be a warm, uh, dry, hot one. Uh, predictions for next winter, uh, look at the, at the federal climatology reports, is uh, for a warm, a warm winter next year. So uh, hopefully uh, the 2019 uh, summer supply plan will uh, be as, as positive uh, if we do uh, go through a winter that is uh, dry uh, at least what is being predicted right now. But uh, we're in good shape, plenty of water, and uh, just kind of ready to, uh, you know, just have our folks use it wisely, and we're ready to uh, deliver what they need. Okay. We had um, a memo included in our packet, and I would ask the members have any questions that uh, we'd like to address to uh, Manager Stahl. And I'm, I'm assuming maybe that we'll get into a lot yes. of the yes. issue in a little bit. Yes, definitely, President Lewis. So if there's nothing burning, I'm, uh, I'll let you continue with your presentation okay. for okay. Or are you asking? Yep. No, so item number seven, we can go ahead and, and go right into it. The, uh, the information that I provided to the board earlier in the week was in preparation for the, the presentation. There, there's a lot of information that I, I will be discussing with the board today, and I, I wanted them to at least have the background information before I started talking specifics. And so I, I felt it was at least a, a good idea to get the, the uh, I guess they call it the metadata upon which we've drawn conclusions. And then uh, I'll, I can go ahead and, and go through those individual items as well. So. Okay. And uh, you, you'll probably let us know that some of this is with information from consultants on 20 year plans and other Correct. stuff that kind of works into where we're, where we're coming from. You bet, you bet, President Lewis. So uh, what we have tonight is a, a discussion on, uh, you know, basically three topics, groundwater costs, comparison of those costs, and development schedules. And so what I tried to do is to, uh, in, in preparation, I sent the board three documents uh, to take a look at. And I'll, I'll kind of review them uh, one at a time, uh, just uh, briefly, and because they are part and parcel of the uh, discussion that we're going to have. The uh, first item is, is titled Cost of Groundwater, and what this uh, information uh, is provided is uh, we have data on uh, the cost of our, our utilization of groundwater and the amount of groundwater since uh, the system was brought online in the mid-2007 uh, uh, that you can see. The, uh, the cost of that was pulled from audit reports that uh, we have uh, tracking on that. 
And we have the data, production data, uh, that our SCADA folks, uh, uh, well, Joey and Andy and Jay, uh, have that information where they're pulling it right off of the uh, meters. And so we can calculate kind of a cost per 100 cubic feet of water uh, that we, it costs us to produce groundwater. Then the next column says Portland cost per 100 cubic feet. And the Portland cost is what our contract, uh, that annual cost was that year. And then the final column is one that uh, the, the staff, we posed the question to the Water Bureau if we did not have groundwater to handle peaking seasons, that's uh, July, August, September, and we had to rely on Portland. We, you know, we were drawing more water during those three months, and our peak three days were being managed through Portland. What might our rate have been each one of those uh, three years that you see in front of you, actually four, but unfortunately I don't have the 2018 data yet. So, so I'm gonna focus on uh, fiscal year 2015, 16, and 17. And so by taking that information, uh, we can then uh, have a three-year average of what our groundwater cost us, what Portland's cost to us was just for water, and then what our cost would have been had we not had uh, groundwater to uh, rely on. And, and the big point here is that the groundwater cost that you're looking at, that 61.613, uh, the three-year average, that is using groundwater, uh, I'll term it inefficiently, but it is basically we are maximizing our, our wholesale contract purchase. Uh, we're committed and we're paying for a certain volume of water from Portland whether we use it or not. So we want to maximize the amount of water that we're taking from them before we start using groundwater to augment with. And so what happens is our groundwater supplies are turned on, they're turned off. They're turned on, the reservoirs are full, they're shut off. And for groundwater wells, if you want them to run efficiently, you turn them on and you let them run. They're, they're happiest uh, when they're on and they're just running. Uh, they, they are the most efficient. Uh, your cheapest water comes from that because you're starting and stopping. Uh, you have a cost, uh, electrical cost that you have, and you never allow those pumps just to deliver water at their peak efficiency all the time. So the cost that you're seeing here, the 61 uh, 3 cents, compares favorably, and I'll talk about how, you know, the favorable comparison, uh, both with how we buy water from Portland and what our cost would have been had we not had groundwater. So that'll be part of the presentation. Uh, the next document is a Portland future rate adjustments. And, and what this uh, shows, and, and it ignores all the years leading up to 2026, which is the last year of our contract. And it, the reason it does that is we're locked into that wholesale contract. It doesn't matter what we do, Portland's cost is gonna be Portland's cost and there's no way we can avoid it. So starting in 26 though, that's the last year of the contract, Portland has given us two years worth of data that showed what their price would be uh, in those two years. And then, uh, so we have that information. The kind of the orange, uh, pinkish uh, box, that is uh, costs that Portland has given us of what uh, our cost would be if we continued to buy water at the rate we are buying uh, it currently. Uh, beyond 26. So as soon as the filtration plant comes online, which is around, uh, you know, that 28, 29 uh, period of time, you can see how those costs start to jump significantly. And then the final column, that purple uh, kind of light blue uh, box, what I've done is I've taken the cost of our groundwater 
uh, what it, it currently is at, and I've said if we buy all our water that we're currently using, if we take our Portland purchase contract and charge ourselves what our groundwater costs, what would our, our costs be in those fiscal years that Portland has given us? So I have a number to compare with. I can compare groundwater, our current groundwater costs escalated because I'd want to be sure that we're comparing apples to apples. So I've taken our current price and I've increased it 4% a year right straight through the years that you see here. So we're comparing apples to apples with the information that Portland gave us. And you can see, uh, I'll have a slide that talks about the difference in what uh, the avoidance is going to be uh, if we were to go strictly to a groundwater supply. And then the last document has to do, the very top bar, is what our demands are projected to be, and this is a calculation that I have done, uh, of what our demands will be through 2030 and then 2032. That, that information is there as well. Because what I want to know is not only what our average daily demand on an annual basis is going to be, but I also need to know what our peak days look like. And so what I've done is I've taken uh, the last two years in green, 16, 17, 17, 18. I know what the, that information is. I know what the average day consumption in the district is. We also know what the peak day is. And so what I've done in those two years is I picked the highest average day and I, I have picked the highest uh, peak day number and I've taken those numbers and then I've escalated them going across the top. The master plan uh, stated that we would see about a 0.5% increase, growth increase on an annual basis through the end of the uh, uh, master plan, which is around 20, uh, 2032. Uh, if you take a look at that information and how we're escalating, the, the numbers at the very uh, right side of that box are kind of what our demands would be at a half of a percent. I've also run the information, and during the presentation, I'll tell you what 1% looks like. Uh, and it's not much higher than what you're seeing here. But we need that information because if we are looking at uh, going more heavily into groundwater, we need to know what we need. And, and so that provides us. The blue box next is uh, a schedule. Um, we need a schedule to get us there. And so that uh, we've gone through this, uh, I've sat down with Andy and Joey and Jeremy to uh, really take a look at where we're at, what we need to build and, and in order to, uh, to be at a point in time where we can convert the entire system over to groundwater. And, uh, and I'm happy to say uh, we can do it. We can do it. Uh, I think we've got a solid plan here. So what I'd like to do is go through the presentation and uh, you'll see the information on these three sheets as we go through it. And as I'm talking about a specific sheet, uh, I'll stop. And then I'll just ask if you have any questions because I gave you a lot of information to look at before this presentation, mainly because there's a lot of information uh, that we need, and and we can't uh, we can't afford to wait, and in, in and the clock is ticking. So with that, uh, the uh, the presentation really has to do with uh, uh, groundwater cost comparisons and development schedule. And before we started, I, I just wanted to throw these three quotes out to you. Uh, you know, two of the gentlemen are uh, pretty well known. The one in the middle is a, a scientist that, uh, that I think has a, a, a pretty good quote that, that we need to keep in mind. I'll let you give you a few seconds to look at that. Why these quotes are important is they, they deal with three things. They deal with knowledge, they deal with change, and they deal with imagination. And I can tell you as staff, we are in all three of those areas right now. 
because our groundwater system was set up to work in a certain way. It was set up that all water came to this facility and then was pumped out of this facility to our terminal reservoirs and then was distributed uh, from Bella Vista into our, our grid. And, and that's kind of the way it was, you know, this whole thing was set up. And, and our 2013 master plan recognized that operation. And in our master plan, there, it, there is a, uh, within the master plan, there, there is an expectation that we will be continuing to buy water from Portland at some level. Uh, and I want to say it, it was probably around three million a day. Um, the, the plan that you have in front of you that we'll be talking about today, uh, it, it says we have the water, we have the time, that uh, you know, if we so choose, uh, we can we can uh, be independent. Uh, I've run a number, an estimate uh, from uh, Portland based on TBWD's projected cost, uh, and that's with Gresham and Rockwood continuing to buy water the way we have always bought it, and the future purchase of water from Portland. Uh, I think the easiest way to look at it is. A million gallons of water a day is going to cost about $1.1 million. So if you buy a million a day from Portland, you're going to pay them at least a million uh, one on an annual basis. You're going to pay them for that water. If you need two million, it, you know, you can do the math, what it, what it represents. And currently, right now, our whole focus is we're, we're planning on operating differently. And so we are looking at, uh, from a creative standpoint, how we are going to manage groundwater, how we're going to wheel it around, uh, how we're going to pump, what we're going to pump out of this facility, because our plan is not to pump everything up to Bella Vista in the future when we convert to a greater reliance on groundwater. We will be pumping into the grid from here. That will free up capacity in the 30 inch for you know uh, any our demands of our our partner and future development as well. And we're also looking at maximizing the same situation at our terminal reservoirs. We're looking at Cleveland and we're looking at 141st as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this. But what I want you to all realize is we can do it. We can do it. So the agenda, what I plan on doing is I'll, I'll talk about the cost of groundwater as we currently use it, uh, look at uh, groundwater comparisons with current and future Portland wholesale purchases, uh, a development schedule, and then, le uh, then open it up for the board to uh, ask uh, all the questions that I'm sure you'll have uh, when we get done. So the first thing is uh, looking at uh, the cost of groundwater. So you had this on the first handout. And in essence, uh, you looked at the last three years. So again, it's 15, 16, 17. This is how, we, how much groundwater we use. This was the annual audited cost. We have a cost per 100. This is what we paid Portland uh, because we had groundwater. If we didn't have groundwater, we would we we uh, would have been paying Portland this. So you can see what groundwater represents as far as trying to keep our costs down from Portland. And even though we're you know we're operating inefficiently, the the difference in purchase price from Portland is uh, considerable. And so if you look at just taking our three-year average. And so here is our three-year average from our groundwater, uh, 100 cubic feet. This is Portland's average cost, those three years. That's what we uh, paid Portland. And this is what we would have paid Portland had we not had groundwater. Well, if you just take a look at comparing our cost and what Portland's cost would have been had we not had groundwater, we avoided about $321,000 uh, a year uh, on an average. And so you can see that groundwater, is, is it pays big dividends. 
from what we would have uh, paid Portland had we not had groundwater versus uh, what we can do with groundwater even as inefficiently as we use it currently, uh, we still are, are dollars ahead uh, utilizing groundwater in our activities and stuff. So I'll, I'll pause there before I go to the next slide, which is going to be comps, and see if, if there's any questions of the board on this information. I, I would ask that your uh, assumption from a uh, using groundwater different differently or not as efficient as we could what are those basic elements what what are those uh entail that gets us to efficient okay <clears throat> great question president lewis uh, what, what, what we'll uh, planning on doing as we uh, go to a more fully groundwater system is our pumping costs and our cost per hundred will go down so instead of 61 cents, the, the more groundwater we produce, uh, we're going to be able to drive that price down because those pumps are going to be running more efficiently. They're going to produce a lot more water. And really, it, uh, the, pretty much the only charge that we'll have is electric and chemical. Uh, because from a, a, a labor standpoint, the system is monitored. There is labor involved with, you know, just making sure that everything is running the way it should be. But we're doing that anyways right now. There, there may be a slight increase in the uh, number of trips we make. But overall, for the amount of water that we're getting out of those wells, it's going to be a higher quantity of water, which is going to drive the price down. So uh, right off the bat, that is one of the things that will change. Uh, the other thing that uh, is uh, good to note on how we're operating differently is we don't plan on pumping everything out of this, this uh, off this site. Uh, pumping up to Bella Vista and then ha gravity flowing it out of Bella Vista. We plan on using the pumping capacity that we have here to pump directly into the grid. We can do it with, uh, with high efficiency, lower horsepower pumps than we have to move large quantities of water across the grid. Uh, we'll be looking at, uh, you know, variable frequency drives. These are pumps that uh, pump up, and when, uh, you know, the demand starts to fall off, they ramp down. So they're on a variable speed. They run as fast as the demand dictates. And so we'll be operating our pumps, uh, you know, a lot more efficiency, smaller horsepower pumps, but we'll, we'll be able to, you know, it'll be a lot less money than pumping, you know, all that water up to Bella Vista and then gravity flowing it out. So, and that's going to happen at not this facility. It's also, we're planning on having that happen at Cleveland and also uh, 141st. So, what, what is that transitional uh, period? So, when. Uh, a new well comes on and, and comes into facility here and at that time uh, starts going into the system uh, versus one way up the hill and out. Uh, does our life, thinking that uh, pumps cost a lot mm -hmm. and when we upgrade to a more efficient pump, uh, various speed, will have that expense, mm -hmm. but are we near a life expectancy of our existing pumps, mm. or did we like put them in last week oh. and we're gonna <laughs> turn them over now? Yeah, no, uh, an another you know, great question. Uh, no, it's we're going to take full advantage of what what we have. We we uh, the pumps that we have pumps if you treat them right will last years and years and years. Uh, as long as you're treating them right and uh, taking care of them, doing uh, the monitoring, the harmonics on them, making sure that uh, periodically you can take them out. You can have them uh, what's called. Uh, 
uh, bake dipped and rewound if you have to, uh, trim them up. Uh, it, it's the sky's the limit as far as efficiency. But no, what we have is, you know, we have variable speeds right now. That was one of the smart things the district did when it built the, uh, the existing pump station. We continue to do that in any of the uh, pump station improvements that we're doing. Uh, our plan is is to try to maximize the use of what we have, and if we can move uh, a, a lower horsepower pump into another uh, situation and move a higher horsepower pump here to satisfy a, a performance, then we're, we're planning on doing that. So uh, we're definitely going to maximize the use of the investments the district have, and I think that you know the, the investments were wise investments that uh, we're going to be able to use for a long time. And that's the plan. Uh, if we go, uh, as I get toward the end, you'll see a schedule uh, that we'll have, and I'm going to talk about those different elements and how we get there. The other beauty of this, uh, the, the whole schedule and process that we're under is, by and large, our master plan anticipated wells being installed. Uh, we are taking a look at our CIPs for pipe placements because that, that those wells have to be routed either to here or to uh, Cleveland or 141st. We have CIPs to replace pipe, and when we replace pipe, there might be opportunities for us to put in pump lines at the same time. We have lines that we have abandoned that we are looking at once again putting back into service because we think they have life and we can use those potentially as pump lines. And so as I, I get into the scheduling, I'll be talking about, uh, well, one thing that we're developing right now is a, a groundwater development concepts paper. And this basically takes a look at every one of our sites and, and is the road map. Uh, what needs to be done at each one of those sites and what needs to be done first what needs to be done second, and, and so forth. And, and this right now is undergoing review uh, internally. And when we get it done, we'll share it with our partner to be sure that uh, you know we've captured not only our needs, but if there's something we could tweak that would make the performance even better, uh, that, that is our plan. Mm -hmm. So. Very good. We're looking at eliminating Portland completely? We can. We have the ability to do that. And that's what we're gearing towards. Um, and as we get towards 2021 and we get answers to our questions, uh, we'll be able to then make that decision, you know, whether we want to have continue to have a, some water, uh, if we want to have no water, if we want to have uh, more water. Uh, there, there's going to be plenty of opportunity for discussion in the future. There is a benefit of having a connection to Portland and the utilization of, of water. Uh, the challenge that we have, one of the, the thoughts I'll, I'll, I'll let you know is uh, we can convert our system from a chlor chlor uh, chlorine ammonia disinfection system to a free chlorine. And that, if we were to do that, then we wouldn't be able to necessarily take uh, the chloraminated water that Portland provides unless it was in very little minor quantities that we could blend out. But uh, from an, a, an efficiency standpoint, from a, uh, uh, our ability to manage our system uh, easier, uh, that, that is one of the things we're looking at. Uh, the reason Portland chloraminates, they use chlorine and they, then they add ammonia, and the disinfectant that results in that, it's a longer-lived disinfectant because Portland, when they treat it at Lusted Hills or they boost it at Powell Butte, Butte they have to carry that disinfection all the way out to TVWD, Tualatin, uh, you know, they, they have to carry that a long ways and they need it to, to stay as potent and chloramination does that. Free chlorine is, you know, something that we don't have to carry our water far and we can manage the disinfection levels that we have in our water by how much, uh, how we chlorinate, how we disinfect the water. So it, if we were to go totally to groundwater, uh, there is an opportunity for us to just go to a free chlorine system and, and use that 
is a disinfection. Um, it, you know, in, in be able to manage our system, I think a lot, it'd be a lot easier to manage our disinfection, our water aging, uh, you know, the stagnation that, that we uh, can see in certain areas of the district and that, so. Okay, no other questions? Uh, I'll go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, so the big aha moment in this entire discussion and one that really wasn't anticipated uh you know when you when you took a look at our uh, 2012 uh, master plan was the size of the increase that we were looking at from portland uh, the 2013 2012 master plan never anticipated that by 2030, it, there was a potential for the district's cost to Portland to triple. Uh, you know that that was a, you know a something that was unknown. Uh, we didn't know the extent of that cost and, until uh, here uh, this year, uh, when Portland finally gave us the information to try to at least uh, give us information that we could start preparing. And, and making plans on. And so if you take a look at you know, where we're at, you know, the normal adjustments that Portland would have been providing us are in this column here. And so what that entails is you can see in, in 2027, they were anticipating about a million uh, year jump in our cost. And a lot of this has to do with the loss of Tualatin Valley. You know, they lo lost the, ma the major wholesaler. And so, you know, the cost difference for everybody who is still standing is, is going to be considerable. And so that's uh, one of the reasons for the, uh, the million dollar. And then as you see, 2028, that was the last year that they had provided, or 28, yes. Uh, you could see that it, it continues to raise, not as great, but it, it bumped up just slightly uh, higher than 27. And, and you have things coming online. There's corrosion control, uh, pr uh, preliminary corrosion control that we're going to end up uh, being charged for. So all of that is being uh, coming into play. The second column, now this is the high end of what uh, the filtration plant is estimated to cost. Uh, they gave us two costs, 350 million and 500 million. Um, I, I am um, a little bit apprehensive uh, thinking that 500 million is going to uh, be the top. I, I think it will be more knowing that uh, we are out to uh, 27 and uh, taking a look at how uh, projects have, have cost from estimates uh, here uh, regionally. But looking at their figures, uh, their high-end figures, you can see that in 29, uh, we start to see a significant jump because they are, uh, they're anticipating that the filtration plant is coming online. Uh, you know, there are costs that they can go ahead uh, and uh, provide uh, to wholesale customers. And by 2030, uh, the facility is fully online. The costs are fully assigned. And if you take a look at this last column, and again, this is our groundwater. Uh, you know, the current uh, price that we have, and again, escalated, I've, I've escalated that by 4%, so we're, we're com trying to compare apples to apples. Well, you can see in 2027, if we were totally on groundwater, the difference in cost between what Portland is looking at and what our groundwater, uh, we have about a 1.6 million cost avoidance by totally being on groundwater. Uh, as you get into the next year, in 28, that increases to a little over 2 million. Uh, in 29, we're up to uh, about 3.8. And then when you get up to 30, the uh, cost avoidance is about 5.4 million. Um, startling numbers, uh, you know, as far as potential cost to the district, if we continue to purchase uh, you know, water from Portland, uh, you know, if, well, if we, if we don't 
if we utilize our groundwater, you can see what our cost would have been versus what it, you know, we're anticipating it will be. So if you start extending that price out and you say that first year uh, it's 1.6, next year's 2.1, you can see by the time we hit 2030, you know, we have a, a price tag uh, of about close to 13 million that, uh, you know, the district is either going to have to pay or we're going to have to do something different. And, and the difference right now uh, is what we're anticipating is groundwater, uh, developing more groundwater capacity. So, so Brian, would that mm -hmm. be at the level that we purchase now? Correct. Okay. Correct. That is, uh, right now, uh, we are under contract to purchase about 3.8 million 100 cubic feet. That is uh, what we are currently purchasing. Uh, that is not anticipating uh, the growth that you're seeing uh, on the growth chart. So that is not included uh, in this figure here. That is just we're buying 7.8 million on an average day uh, and the peaking factors without groundwater are not loaded into this as well. So it's, it's kind of like even, even at 9.176, that number is anticipating that we're still using groundwater to, to offset our peak demands from Portland. You said that we're still purchasing the same amount whether we use it or not, basically. Correct. Correct. At this time, uh, the the contract ends in 2026. Uh, at that time, uh, well, in 2021, we have to let Portland know what our future plans are. Uh, whether we are looking to uh, re-up the contract uh, so that they they can then plan. And I would anticipate at that time they would probably want to have an inkling of how much we're anticipating purchasing from them so that then they can prepare. Uh, right now, the facility they're looking to construct is about a 160 million gallon a day facility. Uh, and, uh, and so they're anticipating that, you know, we're, we are continuing to buy at the level we are and Gresham is continuing to buy at the level they are. Uh, but we both, uh, at least our discussions with Gresham, is they are looking at this shocking number uh, pretty much the same as we are, uh, what it represents as far as future costs to their, their uh, rate payers. Okay. So when we start to, and, and were there any other questions on the second handout? They, they, they are startling numbers. I, I will not kid you. When uh, we saw those numbers, it, it, it was something that uh, it, it, that, that generated uh, a future slide that I'll, I'll, I'll save and, and show you when we get to it. If we put in two or three joint wells or a independent mm -hmm. well on our own, how much is that going to change your, your down the road numbers? Uh, as far as production numbers or uh, purchase numbers? Purchase numbers. Purchase numbers. Uh, right now, uh, if we continue to buy water at uh, 3.8 million, it might bump this number up uh, a little bit, but then again, it would, it would have bumped Portland's number up as well. So these numbers are, you know, anticipating that uh, we're using average day, you know, 7.8, and we're peaking, and, and I'll get into that, uh, so you can kind of see where our peaking numbers are, kind of what we're using groundwater now, and in, in what Portland, uh, what portion of uh, the experience Portland is contributing versus our groundwater. So I have a slide that I, I hope uh, will answer uh, your question, Director Dixon. So. What we wanted to do is to really start the process of, of, of saying, how much water are we going to need? 
And so we know, uh, you know, what our experience is currently. So on that uh, third handout, you saw the 16, 17, 17, 18. These are real numbers. This is what our, this is what our system does right now. You can see that uh, the high end of our peak day was about 9.8 million. So if we're using uh, if we're uh, buying uh, uh, 7.3 from Portland, uh, 7.4, the balance of that is made up with groundwater. So uh, at 9.8, uh, you know, whatever it is that, uh, you know, is over and above uh, the 7.3, 7.4, uh, that is all groundwater uh, that we're peaking on this system in that. So I'm, I'm going to try to shift gears and shift it more towards groundwater what do we need on the groundwater side so if you look at 26 uh, and this is kind of what our proje pro uh, projection is for 19 we're looking at an average day of around 6.5 our peaking is still under 10 it's probably going to be close to 99 nine. Uh, hard to say it could be easily over 10 uh, could be 11 uh, depending on how uh, folks use water this summer but if, if they continue the trend, and by the time we get to 2026, these are our numbers. So uh, if we go strictly with groundwater, by 2026, uh, we need to have about 10 million a d average day groundwater in our pocket. And we need to have enough groundwater capacity to at least hit a peak day of about 13.3 million a day. So that's how much groundwater, if we're going to completely go off, off of uh, Portland, we need to have that much groundwater in our pocket uh, ready to be turned on in 20, at the end of 2026. If you extend that out to 32, you can see that by the time we get to the filtration plant is online, we're looking at about a little over 10 on an average day. And our peak is still under 14. It's around 13.7. But again, you know that number, uh, you know, it, it can it can change. So we need a little buffer. Whatever it is that we develop on the groundwater side, we'll always want to have some buffer. The master plan, it looked at uh, starting 13 at about 10.3 and then escalating to 16. Now I will say. The 9.8 and the 10 that I'm showing for an average day, the master plan recognized a need to put in about 3 million in industrial growth. And so we have added from this 6.5, once we hit 2022, we added an additional 3 million for commercial industrial development in the district anticipating that if microchip uh, needs the water, we need to make sure that we are prepared to provide them that water. As we take a look at development within the district, we're seeing uh, multifamily residences coming in um, like gangbusters. Uh, we do have area that is developable for uh, commercial industrial. So there is a through three million a day allowance for growth and development in the system. So if you just looked at that 9.8, uh, if in 26, if we were to just go off our, our use now and ignore that 3 million, we, we'd be about just under seven on an average day. Adding another 3 million for uh, growth in, in, in industrial development to make sure that we're not caught uh, holding the bag if we do have a big water user coming in. Okay, so this is kind of our, our, our groundwater setup right now. Uh, we have, again, uh, we talked uh, back in January, February about reliable groundwater. And typically when you calculate reliable groundwater, you, you take one of your big producers and you take it offline and you anticipate, okay, it's something happened to it. And so if you look at our reliable groundwater, right now we own all of three, all of four, and we own about a third of five. So if you take and leave three on, you take the third of five. So right now we're looking at about 6.7 million gallons a day of reliable groundwater. Now we can produce more, but from a reliability standpoint, 
that that's what we have. If you look at the wells that are online, you notice uh, this is Cascade 6 and it's 223rd. I have nothing coming from Cascade uh, 6. I can tell you Cascade 6 is in play. So this number that you see down here does not anticipate 6 being online, but we're anticipating it will be online. And that is one of the things that I'll talk a little bit about Cleveland. That's where Cleveland comes in. And again, um, totally out of the box now. Um, I am calling it either, you know, we're delving into the crazy pill jar or it's it's thoughts from the windshield where we you can't even shut off thinking about developing and how to move water in the district and what we need to do to make sure that we hit these time frames. And unfortunately, it is now spilling over to Andy and Joey, and I've got Jeremy and Jay. They're thinking and breathing this stuff about what can we do to get water from point A to point B where we've never done that before. How do we do that? And so Cleveland Reservoir is uh, one of our uh, reservoirs that we have, but Cascade 6 is a well that, uh, a test well that Gresham drilled on district property at 223rd and Stark. Right, I'm familiar with it. Yes, and we know what that capacity is of that well already. Okay. We, we've done that work, so we know how much water we can get out of it. Seven, eight, and nine are three new wells that we're anticipating uh, starting the process of developing. Uh, seven is a well that we would like to have placed over near 141st. Eight and nine are wells that we are looking at to pump back to this facility somehow. And I'll talk a little bit about some discussions that we're having. I don't want to give say a lot about it because we're, we're having kind of staff level discussions with different agencies, entities, and uh, so far we're very positive about the reception and we're, we're very positive about the potential partnerships that we have in the future over and above the partnership we already have with Gresham and, and them looking at uh, a city of Gresham owned property for well development. So we've, we've got a lot more irons in the fire. And so you can see with just uh, the development, even ignoring six, with the development of uh, seven, eight, and nine, we're down to around 14.7 uh, of reliable water. Well, if you take a step back, you can see at 14.7 by 2026, we're anticipating we're going to need around uh, 13, a little over 13. By 32, we're going to need under 14. So just in the well development schedule that we have right now, we're anticipating if everything goes according to Hoyle, uh, we'll be looking at around 14.7, just under 15, that will be available to us. So this is, uh, you know, kind of my, uh, the incomprehensible slide uh, that you had on your third handout. And what this is, uh, it's the schedule. Our master plan is anticipating a lot of these costs. So the beauty of our master plan right now and the rate adjustment schedule that we have going into the future, we're anticipating a lot of these costs. And since I developed this slide, uh, you know, we have other revelations that we're dealing with that may change, uh, you know, uh, locations. It may change somewhat the pricing. Uh, we may not need as much property purchase as what you're seeing here. And if that's the case, then that money can then uh, be utilized for other, other purposes within the district. But in looking at the schedule, you can look at, uh, look at uh, next year, uh, 1819. So this is our fiscal year. We're anticipating, uh, you know, the, the goal is, is to drill one, two uh, test wells. And we are to the point now, depending on the location, of uh, if we have a high level of confidence of just drilling a production well at that time, bigger casing. Uh, you know, and, and set up to take a production well when we actually build the well house, put in a pump and motor, uh, but we will have the column 
uh, the tests done, the water quality information ready to go the next step, which is going to be building the well and then uh, doing the piping wherever this well is located. So we have two wells. We do have a uh, property purchase on a well uh, near our 141st reservoir. So one of the, the wells that we'll be looking at doing, uh, if we can, is near 141st. This well here is 141st. Uh, so these two wells here are the ones closest to the uh, Halsey, our Halsey property. This one here is uh, in closer proximity to uh, 141st. You can see that we have master planning going on. We'll need to do a, a site master plan of this site because we're going to be doing things differently. We're just not pumping water out of here anymore. We're pumping it into the grid. Uh, we'll be doing uh, analyses that you don't see on here uh, of the Cleveland service zone. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, after uh, we get through uh, this information. Uh, you can see we have cascade pumping improvements here, anticipating uh, adding additional pumping, uh, increasing horsepower, looking at distribution pumping so that uh, we're not moving water to Bella Vista, we're moving it into the grid. Uh, you can see we have uh, groundwater. This is full development. So we here, we've drilled the holes. We have the pipe in the ground. It's ready to go. We're looking at in 22, uh, this is full development now. Uh, we have the motors, pumps, everything is in place and going. Uh, this is the 24, so we have an additional well so that all three of these wells are accommodated. And these prices that you see here, they're big numbers, but they're shared numbers. So uh, I just want the board to understand, these are going to be shared numbers. The only one that may be fully ours is uh, 141st. But there will be discussions with Gresham on that because development of 141st definitely allows Gresham to take more fully full advantage of this site to pump water up to Grant Butte. Their system's a little bit different. They have to move water to Grant Butte in order to distribute it to their grid. You know, they, they're stuck. They don't have the grid situation that we do or the luxury of being able to pump out of this facility directly into their grid. Because between our facility here and their distribution system, uh, it's a long way. Uh, their closest pipes are at the intersection of 223rd and Stark. Uh, 223rd and Stark. That's really the closest touch point we have for that. But that's not to say they are then able to take it full advantage, fuller advantage of Cascade 6, because that Cleveland tank has the ability to pump uh, more directly into. Gresham's grid, and so there will probably be a, an interest on their part of pumping more water out of Cascade 6 into their grid than perhaps we might need, and, and that will free us to, to, get, to take water from somewhere else. Okay. Any questions on the schedule? Yes. I have a question about the, why the new Cascade 4 from the equation. Ah. Okay, the, uh, it has to do with reliability calculations. And typically when, you're, when you talk about groundwater, uh, you look at it as how much reliable water do you have. And engineers and, and folks that are managing groundwater systems, they're, mechan they're electromechanical systems, so things can go wrong. And typically things go wrong when you need it the most. And so what they always try to figure is that if you're talking reliable water, you want to, you want to take out one of your big producers and try to live off whatever is left. And so even though as we use groundwater, four will be in the mix. In fact, four will probably be online more than three if truth be told. 
but if we had to talk about reliable water, we would eliminate four from the equation and just rely on three. Even though, you know, in the scheme of things, four will probably always be there for us to use. But from a reliability standpoint, you want to, you just want to make sure that you're not overstating the exact amount of water that you have in an emergency situation. You may have it, but then again, again, things, when you need things the most, typically that's when things happen and, and you'll lose a big producer. So it's better to, to uh, anticipate the system's going to lose something and then try to make up the difference with whatever else you have. It's better to have more water than, than end up, you know, not having enough. And that, that's why we, we remove four. <coughs> that one looks like 50%. It, it's a big producer. It is, yes. And, and, uh, and we're anticipating that four is always going to be there, but if I'm talking reliability with you, I don't want I, I to overstate the fact that we're always going to have three, four, and our share of five available all the time, uh, 100%. I'd, I'd much rather, you know, be a little more conservative and say, you know, if we have an electrical problem and we lose four, you know, can we manage with just three and, you know, the, the amount of five that we have? And, and while we anticipate three new wells, um, th there's that numbers game that you just described with uh, uh, out of one out of seven being removed or the weak, weak spot mm -hmm. that might go down, mm -hmm. at what point do you get to, uh, we have 15 wells and we're thinking two weak spots in, in the numbers game. Yeah, yeah, no, it, good question. It's, uh, I think the, I think with the number of wells that we're looking at, uh, I think, you know, the, removi the removal of, you know, four, it seems to make sense mainly because it's all pumping into, uh, into our Cascade facility here. Uh, as we talk about schedule well, beyond this, the, the, one of the slides coming up, uh, everything that we do, right now we, we have a well at uh, Cascade 6 at 223rd. Uh, and we're anticipating utilizing Cascade 6 to send water to the Cleveland Reservoir. And then depending on, uh, you know, the, the need and how we can configure it, it may be able to pump right into our grid, uh, the district's grid. So we'll have water going down to the tank. We'll have water bypassing the tank, whether it goes to us or Gresham, and then water, the bulk of the water filling the tank. So, so that water. But what happens if 223rd goes down? So we need to make sure that we, you know, in our system, whatever we're pumping up to Bella Vista, Bella Vista then would take over and serve that 223rd zone. And so we, we want to make sure that in, in something similar could happen with 141st, where if we have a well out near 141st, that well is going to be a workhorse for that service zone. But if the well goes out, then we need to be able to move water back into that from our main zone. And so everything that we're talking about, and in, in, in one of the things I'll be talking to you folks about in the future, is this kind of uh, how it might work. It's groundwater development, how it might work. And so this is, you know, three staff members had got together and said, okay, this is how we envision it's going to work. We're waiting for uh, input now uh, we, we, from, uh, you know, Joey and Jay. And, uh, but, you know, once we get that and we're all comfortable with our approach, then we'll bring in, you know, Gresham to make sure that their needs or their thoughts on how we're operating the system works. And if there's tweaks that we need to make, we'll tweak it. But, you know, the bottom line is we want to be resilient. Whatever we, d we build for the district, if we're committing down to a, a plan of action, we want to be sure that we're covering contingencies uh, across the board because things always happen and we'll want to make sure that we're able to move water uh, across this district 
uh, as painlessly as possible. I, I was only going to um, try to simplify it for myself as if um, we had 15 wells, mm -hmm. then would we consider two of them going offline to have that emergency place of what happens if? Yes, yes. I would say if we had that many wells, we'd probably even take a look at three, you know, three, maybe even four. Um, in looking at systems that have a lot of groundwater, you know, there, there's always, invariably, they, you know, you have a, a 15 well system, three wells are out, or three wells are doing something. You always have uh, also interference. So if you have uh, wells side by side, uh, we typically, we, we won't run three and four at the same time. Uh, we'll, we'll run one or the other, mainly because they interfere with one another. We could run them both at the same time, but the yield is less because they're interfering with one another. They're both pumping a lot of water, but they're not pumping water at the levels that you're seeing up there. Uh, and, and so, yeah. Okay. Does uh, Gresham have any, do you know of it? Gresham have any plan to build their own wells in their area? Right now they've... Uh, you know, right now they, you know, that has been discussed in the in the past. Uh, right now, I think because of the uh, the time frame that we're both operating under, uh, and you know, just the cost efficiency of being able to to develop uh, larger wells together, we can cut. You know, we can reduce cost to each agency uh, by sharing the cost. Um, I think that is kind of their direction right now. Uh, the, you know, the, the discussion we're having right now is uh, if, if we are developing uh, Cascade, I'll say Cascade 7 out at 141st, is there an interest uh, of, of, from Gresham to help us develop that well, uh, which would then perhaps allow them to buy capacity, you know, that contribution at 141st? might give them the ability to buy some capacity of three and four because right now th we own three and four they, they those are not shared wells but i would imagine that uh, there may be interest from gresham to be able to buy into those wells by contributing to us developing a you know they're never going to use 141st uh, a well out in that area we will but 141st benefits them because with us having that well, it frees up capacity on this site to pump more water to them. Uh, it does free up some capacity in the existing wells that, that the district owns. And so there may be capacity that they may, you know, entertain, ask the district if, if we would entertain them buying into that. We have not been asked that question, uh, but that, that is something definitely that uh, I, I know they're, they might be interested in pursuing. If I were them, I would be interested in pursuing that. Um, and so I, I'm anticipating that, that ask in the future. If we, if we get a well down in that area, is that gonna change the pressure zone in that area? Well, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, what that, what that area is going to look like, what we anticipate that area to look like uh, it, on one of the last slides I have. Okay. okay. So where are we at? I'm back to this slide. You know, this, this is where we as staff are. There's three things we're focused on. We're trying to find out what we don't know. We're trying to match up what we do know with what we want to do. Uh, we're looking at any adjustments that we have to make in the grid to, to allow us to do what we want to do. And then we're using our imagination of, okay, can we move water? Uh, you know, the aha moment that we all had here uh, had to do with simply historically how we operate this facility. All the water comes here, all the water gets pumped up to Bella Vista, and then it's fed through the main zone. And then the aha moment came with, with, why are we moving this water up there? We can pump this water out the back. We can pump this water all the way down to Columbia's South Shore. We can move this water into the grid to 181st and through a pipe that Gresham has, 
we can we can connect that pipe to our system over near Interstate 84. We can run water, our water, all the way down 181st to Sandy, connect it back in, in and then uh, jump over uh, Portland's connection, connect it into Gresham, and then we can, in essence, flow water from this facility into the entire South Shore in w that direction, in addition to our pipes that we already have going through Boeing. Uh, you know, we'll end up with a solid looped system in that whole uh, uh, Columbia <coughs> South Shore area. But it's kind of those thinking out of the box now, and that's where we're at. So if you really take a look at our system, you know, this is the, the grid. And if you look around, you can see, uh, and I apologize, you know, it's like taking a map and trying to blow it up uh, 50 times. Uh, but here we are. Uh, this is where the district office is. This is our, our uh, tank here, our cascade tank. We have our three wells in this location. If you look at uh, where cascade six is, there's cascade six. So this is 223rd. Our, uh, our Cleveland tank is over in this area. So we have our Cleveland tank. 141st, we have a 141st tank over in this area. What the plan is ultimately is to expand this 141st grid all the way down to the district boundary or close to it. So all of this, this, this side of the district here will all be served from the 141st tank. Uh, the work that Jeremy is doing putting uh, those crossings under the max lines, those bores that uh, he was doing, that's all part and parcel of that plan to expand this service zone. So by serving, you know, pumping a well to the 141st reservoir, we now can serve this part of the district from that source. That source can flow both directions. It can flow into the main zone, which is uh, this area in here. It can flow, uh, you know, uh, in this grid itself. The main zone will set it up that the main zone then can flow back into the 141st uh, uh, you know, pressure zone right now, and we can do that by uh, through pump stations. We can uh, install a pump station, which is part and parcel of the uh, this whole white paper concept paper that we're doing. You have Bonnell down here, which is a pressure pressurized zone. Uh, we're looking at the Cleveland tank and its proximity to uh, our uh, 223rd. So we're looking at moving water through our pump line that we just installed in our 12-inch groundwater line. We can connect 223rd into the groundwater line down to Cleveland. Uh, we can do have treatment on site. We can uh, boost uh, ammonia in at Cleveland. If we go to a free chlorine system, we can take the water right off of that uh, Cascade 6, bring it right into uh, the district's grid uh, through the val through valving on Stark, and so we're looking at transmission lines that we have in Stark again to maximize the production out of 223rd. We have treatment that we can uh, apply at Cleveland from 220 this uh, Cascade Six. Gresham will be able to take advantage of it because the district has a conduit connection on Cleveland that goes from our tank all the way to division. Uh, we don't have any customers on that except for two residences that we need to get off of that conduit connection. And so we're talking to, to uh, Gresham right now of converting those two residential customers to Gresham customers because they have distribution lines in the area and we need to get them off that conduit line. Uh, that conduit line should be a transmission line Shouldn't be any uses off that transmission line other than getting water from point A to point B. But it is possible when we go to a full groundwater system for us to give that line to Gresham and have Gresham then use that as a distribution line for them from Cleveland. 
And so then they can bring that water directly into their system and take advantage of the well at 223rd because we're looking at about 4 million production out of that well. 2 million of which can go into us, 2 million to Gresham. And so that is all part and parcel of the plan. This facility here, we're looking at uh, you know modifications here that we will be able to pump into the grid. When we talk about Cascade 8 and 9, uh, without getting into specifics, we are talking uh, to uh, different agencies. We're not shy about knocking on doors. Again, uh, we're, in, we're into this mode. Uh, we're looking at knocking on doors of uh, people that uh, we haven't knocked on their door in the past. Uh, and we're asking them the question about partnerships uh, being able to uh, perhaps drill wells on property they own or operate uh, and agreements that we could strike with them for uh, either contributions or water uh, that uh, they're uh, interested in getting. Uh, and so we continue those discussions uh, and we plan on, uh, we have discussions next week, we have follow-up discussions uh, in June, and we hope that by uh, the time uh, the first of the fiscal year happens, uh, we'll be able to uh, take a look at where those test wells, those two test wells that we're going to be drilling, uh, where they're going to be located, and uh, we can then uh, put together a contract to hire a, uh, a driller to uh, start drilling in August or September. Get them on board and, and getting, getting them uh, start uh, poking holes. Right now we have hired GSI to take a look at uh, some sites that, uh, that we're interested in. And so they're doing some work on that to see if there are any fatal flaws answer your question, uh, Director Dixon, on uh, yield and reliability, or, or perhaps it was uh, President Lewis, you know, when we're talking about drilling a well in an area, how confident are we that we're going to get water at the quantities that, uh, that we believe we are? So we're having preliminary work done on that to see uh, where we're at, uh, grid lines to see uh, where wells are located and what their production values are and what we should reasonably anticipate uh, on a, a groundwater yield. And if we have a high level of confidence, uh, we won't be drilling test wells, we'll be drilling production wells. We're, we're just going to drill it once. We're not going to drill a test well, find the water we want, then turn around and drill a production well. We're, we're just going to go into production. And, and then this way, all we have to do is uh, put the pump motor in, uh, the treatment, and pipe it to where it needs to go. So with that, oop, can go the other way here. Answer any questions. Again, a lot of information. It's exciting time for us. Uh, I know it's exciting for, for me. Uh, I, I think when we when we finish this concept paper of how it's going to work uh right now uh, you know not to you know have too big of a reveal you know it's kind of like the the bachelor I, you know i don't want to have a big reveal here but we do have a plan we have a schedule uh you know and we're trying to take a look at that schedule and program it out so that when you uh, take a look at you know the schedule that we have here uh, as we fully get invested in this, this schedule here is going to be a spreadsheet all its own. So the spreadsheet that I handed out to you with that big schedule, I'm anticipating when we get done with this concept paper, that whole page will be a schedule that will encompass all of these elements so that we can then say, this is what we're going to do first, we're going to get this information, we're going to either jump on it, we're going to act on it, or we're going to set it aside and plan for that now, that well development. You know, it's kind of similar to what you see here, where we have two test wells, a third here, then full development is like two years later. So that'll give us the ability to hire the uh, consultant. 
to do the work, to do well, all the design work. It'll give Jeremy time to figure out how we're going to get piping from point A to point B. And, uh, and you know, for both of those wells, we're going to be taking a look at our CIPs and trying to marry uh, our CIPs with program, you know, projects that we have in the area. So we're going to be moving our projects around depending on where these production wells are. Uh, so that when ultimately, when we come to 2021, we have to have information and we plan on getting the information here and here. Once we know where these are uh, and, and the yield, that then will inform us to be able to answer the question here to Portland, you know, to be able to tell them yes, no, or perhaps, you know, this is how much we would like to commit to uh, or none. But the board will have, you know, that'll be a robust discussion when we get to that point. Uh, if I haven't mentioned it, I'll, uh, I'll be, if I did mention it, I'll be redundant. Uh, it, it's about, a, again, you know, uh, just on the current estimates that we have, it's about a million for a million. Uh, if we're purchasing water from Portland. And my gut feeling is, is that that number is probably low because it's predicated on uh, the numbers that Portland gave us and us and Gresham both being full bore uh, with Portland at the current levels we are. And if we, uh, you know, go down this road, we know that that's not going to happen. Uh, definitely not going to happen for the district. And my sense is uh, that Port, uh, that Gresham has already, they have also seen, you know, these startling numbers. And, and they know what it represents to them because, uh, you know, nine million to us, I would say uh, it's probably comparable to Gresham uh, if they continue along uh, with the same wholesale contract that we have currently. I've got a couple notes jotted that mm -hmm. I'm curious about. Yep. Um, if or when we get to that point uh, of still wanting some water from Portland mm -hmm. uh, as a safety valve, as, as mm -hmm. some ability mm -hmm. to take off the conduit, will that new contract going forward, do you think, will adjust a peaking level where or why did well not necessarily why but how did in your best guess a dollar amount coincide with the volume where did oh. where did that yeah. intersect and will that then be rethought or transferred, transmitted ahead into a new contract, will that peaking value uh, change? Right. No, it's, uh, it, it, it's one of those unknown questions that we have right now. Um, no one really, un no one knows what a future contract with Portland may or may not look like. Um, I would anticipate that a the similar approach that Portland has had, and, and, and again, this is just me, um, that they will have a similar approach in determining uh, rates based on average daily consumption and peaking. Uh, if the district, uh, like we do now, we don't peak off Portland. In fact, uh, during the peak months of the year, we only purchase 92% of our average daily uh, purchase from them. And we utilize groundwater to offset that. And the reason we do that is because Portland's formula for their rates and charges are based on those, they're based on t three things. Uh, it, and this is simplistic, but it, it's, it, it's really three things. One, it's your average day purchase every day of the year. So for the district, that's 7.8 million. So we, we've said when we entered into the contract, that will be our average daily demand every day of the year. 
and Portland in that then gets factored into this huge computer model that spits out rates. The second component is peak season. So that's the 91 day period of time from July 1 through September 30th. That water t typically has a higher pr price point because it is uh, peak demands. So there's a lot of capacity that has to be built and maintained to meet that peak capacity. There's more water that has to be moved or, and treated during that uh, period of time. So it comes at a higher price point. And for those people that need, they peak off the system, that their demand, how they peak, if they, uh, as an example, a, a utility may say, we need 50% more water during that 91 day period. Well, that 50% more water then adds a higher price point, higher value of cost to ultimately whatever their rate may be. And then the last item is peak three days, because we, Portland recognized in the wholesale contract, and it was uh, through the negotiation that there may be three days out of the year, well, initially it was out of the summer peak season, where the peak demands on the system are going to be even higher still. You're going to have three sweltering days, and so instead of 50% more during that those three days, you need 80% more. And so there's a, a, a declaration or a, a request to have those three days peak met through your wholesale purchase. And, and again, those three days come with an even higher price point. So when you factor all of that in, that's where the rates come from. We are able to get cheaper rates because we don't peak. In fact, during the peak season, we, we s tell Portland, we're only going to use 92% of the water our average day. And for our peak three day, we're only going to use 94%. So we're never going to use more than 94% of our average day any day of the year. Or, well, any day of the peak season is what the original uh, agreement or I guess the original interpretation was that that has since been expanded but uh, that that is it in a nutshell and so we knew we had groundwater we knew we would then use groundwater to meet these peak demands so so we're able to drive our price down from Portland and that so what the ultimately the wholesale contract looks like my gut feeling is is it's probably going to be pr pretty much predicated on the same assumptions the same input that they're getting from whoever is still present, uh, how they allocate, uh, you know, typically all the assets are allocated based on demand. Fewer wholesale customers mean that the value of an asset uh, has got to be shared with fewer people. So if you happen to still be there, your share of that asset is going to be increased, mm -hmm. which is going to drive your rate higher. Uh, but what ultimately, you know, if we were to uh, approach Portland and, and ask to maintain a, a connection or we uh, in, even maintain a connection, you know, what, what might that price be to maintain the connection? Uh, what emergency agreements we may have that if uh, something catastrophic happened where we needed water, what might that look like and what might their charge what charge could we anticipate for that? Um, and, and that will all be in that negotiation uh, after, well, leading up to and beyond 26. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what that answer is, but. Well, kind of where I was, uh, why I was trying to understand some basis for their thinking, which is pie in the sky. Um, if there was, in fact, uh, recognition of daily use plus 30% would tell us that peaking point. Um, and that gets extended in, in my wonderment of using extra water that we have to buy anyway and that we're also sharing 
the capacity of well production with with Gresham and the understanding that where their peaking or need might be mm -hmm. cost plus the 30 percent for example um, that outside of their ownership of half a well mm -hmm. whatever that might be come in the future to be to a place that um, we might have ability to share into Gresham and get 30 percent mm -hmm. more peaking mm -hmm. charges that they need but and, and that we have mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that is a premium price above just sharing expenses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it may or may not come both ways we we have to buy expensive water in an extreme emergency from portland similar difference into gresham that caveat little note if this ever happens the scenario well mm -hmm. we, we 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 are paying out in one direction for emergency and, and we have to charge you emergency mm -hmm. as as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Is that a real scenario or consideration when time moves forward and understanding what we get from our wells and some capacity and a lot of other questions are answered to mm -hmm. set that up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. the. Uh the, the current agreement that we have with, you know, Gresham is, you know, basically it's a 50-50 operation of the facility. Um, you know, they have uh, they, their well at $5 million. That's not to say that uh, there are times when, you know, they could take more than that. Uh, more over and above and so what basically we operate the system to you know if they need the water we just send it to them it, it you know it uh, typically it doesn't cost us a lot more just to produce more water um, in mm -hmm. and it's not like we're stressing the aquifer and we don't have the water the water is there so I think you know if if there is a need to buy say I'll, I'll just say portland if there's a need for us to buy emergency water from portland that will benefit gresham um i there's definitely a discussion there i i don't think we'd ever if we had the water or had the ability uh to to produce the water uh, i think we would do that before you know if we had the water we'd do that before we would go to portland and and uh, and try to get water from them to either for us to use or to uh, provide to Gresham. I think with the capacity that we're looking at, the district for the amount of water that we have available, uh, you know, we're first in line as far as the the water is concerned. Uh, if we have excess, definitely share it with our partner uh, because we don't want them to fail. Uh, but if we got into a situation where it was an either or. Then that's a just you know that we definitely are well within our rights to say we're, we have the water if, if you need it and uh, you know and, and you're going to stress us maybe there is a you know compensation or consideration traveling back uh, in order for us to do that but so far we haven't hit that I think it's a, a situation that as we are now 100% groundwater, you know, if, if that's the direction the board, uh, you know, provides, then it's, it's definitely a discussion we need to, you know, have with Gresham on a what-if basis. How do we handle this and to make sure that it's equitable? Um, but at the same time, we're not, you know, we don't want to take advantage of a situation knowing we're partners and we're 50-50ing uh, the majority of our our wells and that some. Yeah, I, I probably uh, as as well as thinking in or wondering if we are buying buying capacity at the peak level to cover ourselves, and Gresham is also, and we're partners. Does that make more water than either of us combined could ever? 
uh, extra expenses that maybe aren't there. I, I mean, necessary um, for maybe a lousy example is if there's um, uh, a lot of water, uh, five, five million gallons necessary that we hardly ever dip into and but we need that capacity in the emergency that the hottest day mm -hmm. and Gresham too has <clears throat> five million extra buy-in then we're, we're both now we're at, at 10 million for both of us seeming to getting at an extreme rather than just coverage, yeah. just, just enough. I, I would say if you look at this chart here, you know, you can see that, you know, by and large, we have shared everything. I, you know, obviously, I still don't have uh, uh, Cascade 6 in there, but it, say if Cascade 6 was 2, that would kick this number up to 16. Mm -hmm. So we would have 17 million gallons available to us to use, even removing Cascade 4. So we'd have 17 million of reliable water that is ours, that is ours. But, you know, we've, you know, we've done the 50-50 and we've taken the wells that are totally ours. What, what we have done is, you know, or let me, let me get that. We, we've done this analysis. So we know what it looks like that we're going to need. I don't believe that Gresham is as far along as we are knowing how much water we're going to need in 2030, 2032. They're not as far along. I know from experience that Portland peak or uh, Gresham, their peak days are much greater than ours. They have a higher demand for water than we do. And the reason being is that they have a lot of residential customers, and residential customers from a peaking standpoint have the largest impact on a utility uh, in this area than a multifamily or a commercial or an industrial. And so, and they're exposed to that. And they are exposed to it in an even greater level because they have Pleasant Valley that is all by and large residential that is developing. They have uh, oh, a spring water that is a mix of uh, residential, uh, commercial, industrial, which is going to take a lot longer for them to develop. So I would say from a availability, we're going to be a lot better shape than they are. Uh, with the amount of water that we have already, well, what we have and what we're planning on building. So right now, if you drew a line across this, this chart below six, you know, we have, you know, in our pocket right now, uh, 6.7, uh, 8.7, almost 9 million a day already in our pocket. Well, Gresham has uh you know this well they have uh what is that maybe five they may have seven already in their pocket well you can see we have nine they have seven they peak at a lot higher rate than we do and so they they, they have a lot of catching up to do uh if we develop seven eight and nine you know will that be enough water for them I think that's something they're going to need to calculate out because I know it's enough for us and that is our ownership of these three new wells. So I know we're going to be, we, we should be okay if, you know, with our schedule, with the time frame, you know, we can do it. I don't know what the answer is for Gresham. That's something that they're going to have to calculate out. Uh, we actually have a meeting uh, with them tomorrow where they're visiting, uh, there's a number of them that are visiting uh, one of the Gresham locations that they're looking at running a test well, which uh, it could be uh, eight, 
over in that area, depending on how fast we can uh, go ahead and develop seven out at 141st. If, if we develop the one, you know, over on Kirk Park, uh, that will become seven. And the next one out at 141st, that'll be eight. Uh, it, it's kind of first in line, you know. And, and if I started misnumbering them, I would drive our telemetry guys crazy. But, you know, that, that's kind of where, where we're at. So from the district side, we can do it. You know, if, if the, the plan that we have in front of you, as long as everything <coughs> follows along, at this point in time, I, I, I have a high, very high confidence level we can do it. Uh, that's, you know, and again, that's today. This is the 23rd of May. If we get a wrinkle in there where some of the plans that we have don't pan out, That'll stall us a little bit, uh, but if we can continue with the plan that we have, I, I've got a very high level of confidence. And I, I think the wonderment by myself, and, and maybe there's not the real answer because we do design for the peak and the, mm -hmm. the most use of the year, and mm -hmm. that happens for a few days, that what can we do with all the rest of the water sure. that we're able to do? Sure, sure. Uh, you know that that's a you know definitely uh, we've had a discussion with uh, Fairview, and uh, because they are looking at um, you know a drilling a production well, and so they have plans on doing that. Uh, you know there there is a partnership opportunity there that you know we've we've kind of let them know uh, that if they're interested. Uh, definitely, you know, it's something that, you know, we, we're, we're all about, about partnerships in this effort. And if we can uh, get good producing wells and increase our reliability and help each other out uh, cost-wise, it just makes sense. So, uh, you know, that's not to say that, uh, you know, there, there may be some, uh, uh, you know, uh, businesses and agencies that may be interested in that as well. Uh, and so we're we're looking at that, you know, uh, in addition to everything else that we're doing with our partners. So, a question. Mm -hmm. I, I think you just answered my que uh, the question. I was going to ask, but I want to mm -hmm. do it a different way. Uh, we have well rights. Mm -hmm. Can we drill the wells out of our geographical boundaries mm -hmm. with them well rights? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We can. Yes, we could drill a well uh, outside the district boundary and plump, plumb it back in. Get that one off. So um, we can, uh, you know, yeah, it, we could drill a well in, uh, you know, in well in Fairview uh, that is in the incorporated area of Fairview and, and bring it back into the district. Uh, it's just the whole planning process, you know. The recognition is is we can't drill a well in a, a an established area of a utility and serve their customers you know we we're routing the the water out of there it's kind of like our bella vista reservoir it's way the heck it, it's way up here you know firmly in uh, gresham's territory but yet you know we fill that tank and we drain out of it and we drain to our 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 location there so I would envision, uh, you know, groundwater well development would fall under the same uh, rules and, and restrictions. What I kind of had in the back of my mind was possibly a joint venture well somewhere in Gresham. Mm -hmm. It'd be owned by both of us, but they get all the water out of it. In exchange, we would take all the water out of the existing well we've already got that they own a piece of. Oh, sure, sure. Have a swap out deal. Sure. Yep. Yep. That so definitely. A lot of piping. Yes, definitely is a, an opportunity. The challenge we have with the, you know, the SGA is the further south we go, the thinner the, the aquifer gets and the, the lower yields that you can anticipate. We were lucky with uh, 223rd. That, that, that is a, a nice well, 4 million. We would have been happy with 1,500 gallons a minute. We got 3,000. Uh, so we were pleased with that. We're anticipating that if that uh, that line is you know is brought straight across the uh, area, you know anything that we drill near 141st, as long as we're on that that cross section line, 
our hope is is that you know we'll get similar results and that's kind of one one of the things that GSI will be looking at right now but, but further south once we start getting further south I mean there there are some good producers in uh, Paul Valley you know I think they had uh, seemed like they had a 1500 couple thousand gallon a minute uh, wells out there I don't know if anybody's here Don Don would have known <laughs> But, right. Yeah. yeah, and those wells belong to Portland, and uh, I, I tongue-in-cheek asked them if they'd ever be interested in selling them to us, and, and that went over about as well as you would expect. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, if you don't have anything else. Great, uh, appreciate it. And what uh, we'll anticipate is, as the uh, this uh, concept paper is uh, completed, uh, future meeting with the uh, the board prob probably uh, in I'd say July, because we'll have a few more answers by that time. But uh, we'll be bringing that back and in doing kind of a here's the schedule, and uh, this is kind of what the plans are going forward. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. If anybody has any questions after the meeting, uh, don't hesitate to call any of us here because this is all we're thinking about. So, you know. <laughs> okay, number eight, we've got for the good of the order. And do you have anything? No, uh, President Lewis, I, I think you probably be pretty tired tired of me talking. Just uh, some meetings coming up uh, and that deal with groundwater development, and we're hoping they'll they'll be positive outcomes. And uh, a couple things, um, we'd advertise for a uh, pipe replacement job. Um, advertise for bids on that uh, ST12. It's the pipeline between. Um, Stark Street, Burnside, a little bit south of Burnside on 212. Um, we got four bids. Um, the uh, apparent low bid was uh, West Tech Construction, which they've done work for us before. And um, so tomorrow we have the intent to award. Um, so that should that should progress pretty well. Uh, the, their bid came in uh, right near our budget, so. Um, we feel it'll be a good project for the district to kind of pursue. Um, secondly, um, we went through our second round of our lead and copper sampling. Uh, if you remember, we were uh, we were kind of uh, removed from the joint monitoring program that Portland had um, ran for a while. So we had to develop our own uh, program, which was a, a pretty big undertaking of getting uh, the 60 sample sites. Uh, so the first round, we had really good results. Um, we were hoping it wasn't a fluke. Uh, the second round, we got the results just recently, and it wasn't a fluke. So we actually, mm -hmm. we, uh, we didn't exceed the action level. We had a couple, we had one substantially high result. Um, we think it might have been um, error in the sampling technique that the customer used, but um, it still kept us well within the, the action level, so we did not exceed. So we may be on track for reduced monitoring at some point here in the future, but um, so far it's it's looking pretty good. Um, and then the one last thing I wanted to mention was uh, the PNWS AWWA subsection conference in uh, Tacoma was, was a pretty good uh, event to attend, and uh, I did volunteer and kind of represented the district in that aspect there. Um, and next year it will be in Vancouver, right across the bridge, and I think it might be a really good opportunity because of uh, the location of it being in proximity to a lot of our uh, employees. It would be a good opportunity for a lot of our employees maybe just to go for a day and experience that kind of network mm -hmm. and possibly volunteer um, and just kind of represent the district. Um, so just thought I'd throw that out there, mm -hmm. and, and thank you for allowing me to go to that. Mm -hmm. Very good. Steve, anything? Um, just one thing. Thank you for the flowers from the staff and mm -hmm. the board um, on behalf of my mother. And it, it was just beautiful. Okay. You're welcome. Kathy? Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, Kathy um, mentioned there was a water tasting. 
and um, so I thought you'd bring that up about next year, participating in that. Okay. It's, it's a curiosity that we know what the logistics are or what it entails. I've heard you just bring your container and it kind of just goes into the mix of. Well, yeah, I don't know. Bitter or sweet? What is, what is, what's that judgment? Called? Human, human palate. You know, <laughs> it's uh, we we will check out the uh, the logistics of it and, and and see what we can do. I I think it is a matter of bringing in so many so much water in glass containers, um, and then go ahead and submit them. So, be fun. Yeah. Good. Larry, do you have anything? I have nothing. Okay. Um, I will say for my piece, I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoops. No, I'll say for my piece um, and trying to keep track of the um, Regional Water Providers Consortium mm -hmm. that I don't expect to hear from them on. Uh, Well, a couple of things. I, I bring that up because if, in fact, I do, when I hear from Portland, rather been accepted into the uh, advisory committee, doesn't happen till July, that um, I would still hope I can uh, ask uh, a board member to represent us into the consortium mm -hmm. where I'm representing now. So while. Uh, that process happens June 6th. We have a consortium meeting, and I will invite a couple uh, board members to go with us into that meeting and see what it's about. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be a good uh, toe, toe in the door on the consortium to uh, see what's, what's going on there. Um, the other thing that reminded me was Troutdale joined us in the yes. consortium. Yes. Yeah. We had some uh, shared knowledge into uh, Troutdale City Council that uh, was able to convince them that they needed to go along with the other 20 some providers and be a part of the uh, emergency if not other aspects that the consortium can mm -hmm. can bring and share uh, knowledge with Troutdale. So I think that will be um, accepted or or uh, noted in that June June meeting of uh, what their intentions are. So good good stuff on the consortium. Thing. Uh, that's that's what I've got. Next meeting June twenty seventh uh, at six o'clock. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. A motion. motion to adjourn. Okay. And I heard a second. <laughs> okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Very good.